them to different combinations of the signaling molecules that are um, already introduced to you and found the precise recipe that allows me to convert the embryonic stem cells that grow in these clusters floating inside the, uh, the medium in the petri dish uh, to induce them very efficiently to give rise to motor neurons. And not only that these cells at the end turned on the gene fluorescein markers suggesting that they became motor neurons, but we could even take them and test their functionality. And for that, what I did, I actually decided to transplant them back into the developing spinal cord and see whether they would be able to integrate into the nervous system and perhaps innervate muscles. But that would be very difficult to do, uh, to take mouse cells and put them back into mouse because the manipulation would have to, have to happen inside the uterus. So instead I decided to <coughs> take the risk and see whether these cells can be transplanted into developing chick embryos. And so here I made openings into fertilized chicken eggs and then I uh, made actually a little lesion. I removed part of the chicken neural tube and implanted back the mouse direct motor neurons. And remarkably, these cells not only survived inside this um, um, different host, but they also started growing axons to periphery. And when I followed these axons, the projections, all the way to the sites where they contact muscles, I could uh, see these uh, specializations called neuromuscular junctions that actually send the signals from the motor on to muscle and instruct the muscle to contract, mm -hmm. suggesting that these cells are actually uh, fully functional. So this was great, we had now plenty of mouse motor neurons, but eventually to understand human disease, we would like to have also <laughs> access to human motor neurons. <laughs> and that turned out to be actually really challenging. <laughs> it, it turned it took us, uh, actually, um, us and other investigators, including my former postdoc, Stefan Nedelek, 15 years, um, uh, and he moved at the time to his own lab in Paris, uh, where he actually investigated uh, on, on different uh, sets of signaling molecules that we, are, we might be missing until he discovered the one additional factor that we need to add uh, to human cells in order for them to differentiate effectively into motor neurons. But now we have as efficient, or maybe even more, a more efficient system to make uh, motor neurons from human uh, embryonic stem cells or pluripotent stem cells. So this was uh, really satisfying because um, um, you know I was al always inspired by a uh, sentence that was left on Richard Feynman's uh, blackboard at the time when he died that says, "What I cannot create, I do not understand." And so my feeling was that if we really understand how motor neuron identity is specified in normal embryo development, we should be able to create motor neurons in a petri dish. And by showing that we can make motor neurons, I think that there was a very strong confirmation that we understand the process in great detail. But then, obviously, it was much more interesting for, for me uh, to try to understand, uh, to ask, um, answer the two questions that I posed in the beginning of my presentation. Why are only motor neurons dying in ALS? And so I, um, I take you very briefly through several years of work in my lab where we started asking uh, what, uh, whether motor neurons show any increased sensitivity to some kind of stressors um, in, and that we can expose them to. Uh, asking basically whether we can identify what, uh, what makes motor neurons more vulnerable compared to other neurons. And so for that we actually used, so, so this is, you're now looking into a petri dish with many different cells growing in it. The, each of these blue dots is a cell, cell nucleus and then the green cells are motor neurons. You see the cell bodies and, and then the processes, the axons and dendrites are growing from these cells. But we, uh, in this experiment we mixed in also uh, spinal internodons which is another type of neurons that um, um, helps to communicate between, you know, in neural circuits um, from one circuit to another. <clears throat> and remarkably, when we expose these, uh, these cultures to a set of toxins, actually toxins that specifically induce protein misfolding, you, you start <coughs> seeing a situation where the motor neurons on the green cells are basically disappearing from the cultures, but the red cells survive. And so this was really interesting. So in this case, we are exposing it to a mycotoxin that is uh, called cyclopyrrhonic acid. But to us, that uh, it really highlighted that motor neurons are much more sensitive to induction of protein misfolding compared to other types of neurons. And that could explain why some of the mutations that cause protein misfolding in genes that are expressed or present in all cells in your body would be preferentially toxic to spinal motor neurons. And so having this, uh, this uh, system where we could basically kill off our motor neurons, 
we can then turn it around and start asking, uh, can we use this to discover new molecules that would make motor neurons behave more like these internal neurons, that they would be resistant to these uh, levels of uh, toxic exposure. And so the, uh, for that, we joined forces with a chemist at Columbia University, Brent Stockwell, uh, who uh, synthesized um, around 120 new compounds for us. And uh, Emily Lowry in my life screened all of these compounds plus 2,000 of other existing uh, <laughs> compounds uh, to try to identify families of uh, small molecules that would be protective to motor neurons. And remarkably, uh, uh, we, together with Brent and Emily, we found uh, one compound that Brent actually synthesized that is very potent in protecting motor neurons. And you can see it again, this is looking now at uh, motor neurons, are these uh, black. Uh, dogs with their processes growing out. So this would be controlled culture looking in the petri dish. Now you expose the cells to the toxin and uh, two days later you see that most of the cells died and the processes shriveled or they fell apart. But now if you expose them to the toxin and add this uh, small molecule inhibitor, you see that you can very effectively protect pretty much all motor neurons in the, in the dish. And so um, uh, we are now taking this, uh, this new uh, molecule that is not approved uh, uh, for use in patients and we have to do uh, a lot of toxicological studies and uh, uh, got a few years ago approval from uh, FDA to start clinical trials and um, actually initially they, uh, FDA allowed us to only start at rather low concentrations because they were worried of uh, potential toxic effects of this drug in patients. But uh, that just two weeks ago, they uh, lifted uh, the, the uh, ceiling for us. So we can now go to concentrations that we believe would be uh, efficacious. And the plan is to start um, dosing first LS patients probably sometime this summer with increased concentrations of this drug. You know, of course, this is just a first step. And you know, from the history, I told you that there's more than 60 trials that failed. So um, there is no guarantee that this will be successful. But what we are hoping is that maybe the, this drug could become a part of multi-drug um, sort of uh, um, cocktail that, um, that will be eventually used to promote survival of motor neurons uh, and perhaps other types of neurons in patients. So this takes me from, uh, I would say, the more um, sort of grounded uh, <coughs> scientific part of my talk to the part uh, which uh, where I get into a little bit more esoteric territory. Mm -hmm. And that's our ways how we are now trying to think about other uh, possible avenues how to deal and treat um, uh, diseases of neurodegeneration. So this is the part of um, where we get into the alchemy of the research. So what, what is alchemy? Alchemy is the uh, search for philosopher's stone and the Philosopher's Stone has been um, described as a, um, as a material that has ability to actually transmutate elements, um, i.e. turn one element into another element, and also uh, that it can serve as uh, an elixir of, of youth. And so what, what is transmutation? What does it mean? So transmutation is described as a process of changing the structure of an atom's nucleus, which results in a change in the identity of the atom. So, you know, it sounds very um, opaque, but uh, it's not something that, uh, that does not happen. Actually, alchemists, although we, we, we sort of think them as little hacks, they were serious about this. And in reality, actually, transmutation is happening. It's happening all the time inside the sun, where hydrogen is uh, fusing into helium. So you are basically trans transmutating hydrogen atoms into helium atoms. 